EVB Channel 5. Talk about remote. Right up past the, the end of Moosehead Lake is the end of the earth. Up here, the creatures are bigger. The landscape larger. There's over 400 miles of shoreline. There's over 300 islands on the lake. And the games, spectacular. Maine's Moosehead Lake by boat. She's a beautiful boat. I think everybody falls a little bit in love with her. By air. This is the type of flying I like to do. I like to get away from the civilized airports. By foot. Never done anything close to this. I'm so far out of my comfort zone, I can't believe it. A majestic main streets and back roads. Moosehead Lake, next on Chronicle. Good evening. Tonight we are off to the wilderness, way up in northern Maine. It's a place where people test themselves against nature or lay back and let the beauty wash over them. Ted Reinstein has our story. It doesn't take a visitor to Greenville, Maine long to detect the theme. Situated at the foot of, where else, Moosehead Lake, Greenville has the distinct feel of a frontier outpost. It's basically an unorganized area, right up past the, the end of Moosehead Lake is the end of the earth. <laughs> You see, Greenville sits on the edge of Maine's vast north woods, wild, untamed, the largest piece of undeveloped land east of the Rockies. Three and a half million acres of dense, mountainous woodlands, with hardly a human to call this immense territory home. Almost. It's actually been 133 years in operation. Continuous. The West Branch Pond Camps, a half hour's bumpy drive from the nearest paved road. Eric Sterling, the fourth generation of his family to run things here in the shadow of Whitecap Mountain, the longest continuously running sporting camp in Maine. We like it just the way it is. We like to keep it real authentic, rustic, and made from original materials from the area. I had two brothers and we were all homeschooled right here at the camps, yep. After heading off to Bates College and becoming a teacher, Sterling realized the world at large had nothing over the simple pleasures of life back here at the camps. He returned and started a family. But that's not to say things never change out here. You really have to expand what you offer because the fishing crowd, it just isn't what it used to be. It used to be a lot of men, big groups of men who would come fishing in the spring and fall. That's really just disappearing. So really what we see a lot more is um, couples looking for just peace and quiet. You know, it's more of the nature-based ecotourism type thing. The first time we came here, it was just so different from anything we'd seen. You're out in the woods, the food's great, beautiful scenery, fishing bird watching and the family is wonderful it's a uh, you can't beat it Barney Scullin and his wife come all the way from Carmel California every September this is our 27th year we're starting to like it we're getting used to the roughing it you know nine rustic cabins line West Branch Pond each has hot water a few hours of electricity at night and a wood stove to take the evening chill off. Looking on the website, it said, private cabin with bath, uh, three meals a day, your linens, your firewood, and a boat. And I said, sign me up. <laughs> Along with her portable spinning wheel, first-timer Ann Thompson of Hanover, New Hampshire, has been doing a lot of reading, camped out on her screen porch overlooking the pond. It's been absolutely wonderful. More than I expect. Could have asked for, really. The heart of any sporting camp is its kitchen. But dinner's still a couple of hours away. Till then, living on the edge of wilderness doesn't have to mean a total absence of some of life's finer pleasures. Out in the middle of Moosehead Lake, the time-honored tradition of frustrating oneself by walking around hitting things with sticks. All under the stern gaze of one of the North Country's most notable natural features, the 800-foot sheer rock face of Mount Kineo. Elwood Duran first visited this remote spot more than 20 years ago. We played golf and the next day and the next day and bought a house here on our way home. Most visitors take the ferry out here to hike the old Indian trail to the top of Mount Kineo. Lesser known is the nine-hole golf course, debatably the second oldest in New England. 
We believe that the course was built in 1893. We're definitely in the top five. The course was built when this remote rock in the middle of Moosehead Lake was a major tourist magnet. At the turn of the last century, the largest inland water hotel in America sat right here and it could accommodate 500 guests. Today, there are just a handful of seasonal cottages out here. Duran has taken on the general manager's duties at the golf course, which may or may not be the second oldest in the Northeast, but is arguably the most stunning. People come here every day flabbergasted. Everywhere you go, there's a view of the mountain, and there's water, and uh, usually a view of the lake. And I don't know that there's a, another golf course on the planet that has those attributes. To get to Kineo, you can take a ferry from Rockwood, but there is an alternative if you are the adventurous type. Because that would take you 23 miles on rough logging roads, then you get out, hike for two miles, all the while carrying your golf bag. I think most people are going for the ferry. I think I'm taking the ferry. <laughs> Coming up, they're on a mission to Munson, Maine. They're all gearing up for the last longest stretch. Taking on the 100-mile wilderness when Chronicle continues. You've heard the phrase, the 100-mile stare. Well, they've seen that a lot in Munson, Maine. That's because a lot of hikers pass through there on their way to finishing the Appalachian Trail. It's where they get ready to survive what's known as the 100-mile wilderness. Here's Ted. <laughs> It is a common sight this time of year in the little town of Munson, just south of Greenville, Maine, long beards and 50-pound backpacks. It's the last town before Katahdin, before the end of the trail, and so they're all gearing up for the last longest stretch. These are through hikers heading north on the Appalachian Trail. Most have been walking since springtime, having started at Springer Mountain, Georgia. 2,000 miles later, they find themselves in this little town, 114 miles from Mount Katahdin, the end of the line. I have never in my life hiked and camped, never done anything close to this. I'm so far out of my comfort zone, I can't believe it. For Ted Leadley of Oregon, walking the AT has been nothing short of transformational. You cannot hike the Appalachian Trail without a spiritual catharsis. Munson is a famous spot on the AT. It's the last town hikers pass before reaching their goal at Mount Katahdin. In between, the most remote and daunting stretch of the entire Appalachian Trail, the 100-mile wilderness. With no resupply points, hikers have to leave Munson with 10 days of food on their backs, but first, they put as much as they can in their bellies. Two scramble, two scramble. Shaw's, a hiker hostel in Munson, legendary for its hospitality and all-you-can-eat breakfast. If you've been eating granola bars and ramen noodles for... You know, for three months, this looks pretty good. Diners order by number. One will get you one pancake, one egg, a piece of bacon, sausage, and home fries. Two will get you two of each, and so on. Numbers that can get out of hand here on the edge of the 100-mile wilderness. We've had people do seven or eight. Some of these guys are really hungry when they come off the trail. Indeed, by the time hikers get this far north, they are walking and eating machines. Maybe I eat about 5,000 calories worth of food a day. As much fat, protein, and sugars I can get in my diet, essentially. Have a seat, guys. Get you set right up. The hospitality hikers find at Shaw's actually extends to the entire town of Munson, legendary for random acts of kindness for visiting hikers. They call it trail magic. Want trail magic for through hikers only. We'll come back to these wondrous occurrences in a bit. For now, let's plunge deep into the heart of the 100-mile wilderness in a relatively magical way to experience this wild country without walking for days under a heavy pack. In the summertime, you can drive here. The Appalachian Mountain Club's Gorman Chairback Lodge. The lodge is brand new. It's a lead registered building. The lodge, based in an old sporting camp, offers guests a full meal plan and private cabins, some dating back more than 100 years. This cabin here is called the library, and it was built by a Civil War veteran. Walter Graff, deputy director of the Appalachian Mountain Club, or AMC, is quick to also point out some more modern options. A number of our members said, well, we like coming, but 
Could we have a, a toilet inside the cabin and a shower? Gorman Chairback is one of two backcountry lodges the AMC has in this wilderness, all part of the AMC's 10 year old Maine Woods Initiative. We had this big idea, but we decided the big idea needed a big place. For the first time in its history, the AMC has put its money where its mouth is, actually buying land, almost 70,000 acres in the 100-mile wilderness, now preserved forever. We thought this is an opportunity for us to kind of walk our talk. We always talk about how people should protect land and why don't we do it ourselves. The AMC may be best known for its hut system in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, but Graf thinks the main lodges take the wilderness experience a step further. It's so remote, there's nothing else around. It's actually a feeling you really even can't capture in the White Mountain National Forest. But once you're here, people really don't want to leave because they're getting much closer to the land. The AMC's Gorman Chairback Lodge is only about a mile off the Appalachian Trail, close enough to lure through hikers as well. Well, and there was one hiker who stopped in for a night and two years later is still there now as a staff worker. <laughs> Just decided to stay. Why not? Next, Ted has a story of love and the lake. To me, she's the Kate. Boarding the boat everybody loves when Chronicle returns. Her name is Kate, and over the years, she has been loved by many, but she's never settled down with any one person. What accounts for this fickleness? Maybe it's because Kate is a boat. Ted has her story. If you had to pick just one word to describe Moosehead Lake, you could do worse than immense. There's over 400 miles of shoreline. There's over 300 islands on the lake. Largest freshwater lake wholly in one state east of the Mississippi. And if Moosehead Lake has a presiding spirit, it is the SS Katut. She's a beautiful boat. I think everybody falls a little bit in love with her. Liz Cannell heads up the Moosehead Marine Museum, a collection of steamship and logging memorabilia. The museum also operates the venerable Katahdin. 100 years old next year, like most locals, Cannell calls the Katahdin by her nickname. It's hard for me to remember to call it the Katahdin. I mean, to me, she's the Kate. And she has sort of, I guess, to me, taken on that persona of a grand old dom of Moosehead Lake. From transporting Victorian vacationers to working log drives, the Cates played a continuous role in this region's history, and no one has a better handle on her importance than Captain Maynard Russell. Hard to imagine uh, life in Greenville on Moosehead without the Katahdin going up and down the lake. For such a huge lake, Russell says Moosehead is a pretty quiet place. It's probably way underutilized. That's the number one remark that people make is, why aren't there more people here? The lack of traffic suits Roger Courier just fine. Basically, we're in uncontrolled airspace up here. This is the type of flying I like to do. I like to get away from the civilized airports, get away from civilization. Float planes are ingrained in Moosehead's culture, once primarily used to access remote sporting camps. Today, operations like Courier's Air Service find the monies in lifting tourists to new heights over this giant lake. And you really can't get the grass bit unless you really get up in the air. Courier says flying a float plane's a breeze. It's the runway that keeps things interesting. They got a lot more variables with our runway out here, which is water. We have to share this water with wildlife, like boats and jet skiers. Tourism and recreation may have overtaken logging at the center of Greenville's economy, but there's still plenty of room for a homegrown success story. To find a job here in Greenville, Maine, um, they're not very plentiful. So out of necessity grew this little company, which is growing and creating jobs, which is very important to me. Abby Freethy admits to a weakness for fries and ketchup. But highly processed ketchups left a bad taste in this trained chef's mouth. 40 gallons of love right here. So she made her own. 
Northwood's gourmet girl was born. We just have a good, healthy outlook, and we think you should eat things the way they ought to be. Fresh ingredients, carefully sourced, the ketchup soon joined by jams and dessert sauces. Now we have 25 products solidly. We have a few that are seasonal, uh, such as fiddlehead ferns and these walnuts, which are completely addicting. Great on a salad, on a loved one, I don't know. Recently, Northwood's Gourmet Girl was nominated to compete in Martha Stewart's online American Made contest. Now, Crate and Barrel has picked up four of Abby's products. It's a pretty big deal for a company this size, so we're running with it. No surprise then that this single mother has had to cut back hours at the little cafe attached to her work kitchen. These days, Abby serves dinner just once a week. But what a dinner it is. Tonight, a choice of jumbo lump crab cakes, beef filet, or vegetable pad thai. I do like to flex my muscles, and I mean, I, I am a chef. It's what I love to do. But Abby still found time to develop a line of chef's clothing. There's no really extraordinarily cute clothing clothing for chefs, so pants, pantalones, super fun. You don't have to be a chef to wear them. They're saucy. Steamboats came to Moosehead in the 1830s, and at one point there were more than 60 steaming up and down the lake. That's right, but by 1935, the Katahdin actually was the last one afloat. Right now she's in winter hibernation, getting ready and refurbished for her 100th birthday next year. That's great. If you plan to hike the Appalachian Trail, you may want to get to know the Trail Angel. They call him Ponytail Paul, and he's ready to help. A lot of people go to the Maine woods to see moose, but others go to see an angel. A trail angel, to be exact. So what is that you say? Ted has the answer. Right now, I'm traveling with Uno, Lotus, and Tea Time. Like almost all through hikers on the Appalachian Trail, or AT, Hammer, Mallet, Slip, Human was the trail name. Ryan Royalty has a trail name. King. Originally from Groton, Mass, King has found a surprisingly tight community along this 2,100-mile path from Georgia to Maine. I'm running into people now that I haven't seen since Georgia uh, back in March. It is much more of a community than I thought it would be. And here in Munson, Maine, that community steals itself for the final push to Mount Katahdin, 114 miles away. Many hikers have one last cooked meal at Shaw's. Whatever they need, we're here. Don McPherson Allen says running this well-known hostel grants her a privileged position. Relationships with her guests tend to be short, but very intense. I'm the keeper of the stories. People are walking off the war, they're walking off divorce, they're walking off retirement, or they're just out celebrating graduating from college. Somebody said, why don't you write a book? And I hear all kinds of things, but they're yeah. mine to keep. The hospitality found at Shaw's extends to the entire town of Munson. This is a note from one of our trail angels of the area. We are avid AT supporters and have a spare bedroom and bath that's available at no charge to through hikers. This type of thing happens pretty much every day around here. People just help hikers out. Paul Stifler, better known to hikers as Ponytail Paul, he is what is known as a trail angel, freely helping out hikers passing through. Today, he gives some through hikers a lift from Shaw's out to the AT trailhead. There are hikers who are going south and hikers coming north and they crisscross and give people my name. When you get to Monson and you look up Ponytail Paul, a lot of them hadn't seen moose and I'll take them out over the hills and find moose and take them swimming and things like that just to give them a break. Carrying a 60 pound pack for, you know, months and months, they take whatever, you know, whatever help they can get. Out in the woods, Eric Sterling and his daughter Avis ring the dinner bell in the main lodge at West Branch Pond Camps, one of the oldest wooden structures in the Moosehead area. All of our meals are home cooked. We do everything from scratch. It's one of the things that sets us apart from some of the other camps. Tonight, juicy pot roast, garden vegetables, homemade bread, and apple crisp made from fruit picked in the yard that day. Recipes handed down from Sterling's mother and hers before that. Sterling says most sporting camps have shut down their dining rooms, but he says the extra work 
is worth it. What happens is when you lose your kitchen, you sort of lose the unique flavor of the camp because that's where all the magic happens. It's a lot different feel when you just convert a camp to housekeeping, and that's the way a lot of them have gone. It's not a bad thing. It's just, you know, it's, it's not the way it used to be. And the way it used to be seems to have lasting appeal up here in the north woods of Maine. Don McPherson Allen tells us Shaw's, the hiker hostel mm -hmm. in Monson, is up for sale. Opened in 1977, it's estimated they have served more than 100,000 breakfasts to hikers over the years. It's incredible. Well, that is Chronicle for tonight. Thank you for joining us. I'm J.C. Monahan. And I'm Anthony Everett. Stay tuned next for our Patriots pregame and then the Pats after that. Have a good evening. We'll see you tomorrow night. Go Pats. Go Patriots.